Since Sinclair Lewis published Main Street in 1920, hardly a novelist has found a kind word to say for the American small town. Instead, it's depicted as a nest of provincialism, conformity, dullness, snobbery, and a public piety concealing a private depravity. Well, if it ever was all that, is it still? We have asked the U.S. Bureau of the Census to use its computers and its great store of figures and facts about this country to find for us the average American small town. We ask it to find a town having exactly the same kinds of people, income, employment, social structure, and voting habits as the national average. We wanted to explore this average town to see what its people were doing and what they were thinking in this election year. No one town is perfectly average in every way, but the one the Census Bureau selected is almost perfect, and that is the one we'll look at now. It is Salem, New Jersey. exactly on the Mason-Dixon line. It is southernish and northernish, pretty and ugly, agricultural and industrial, Republican and Democratic. In the 26 presidential elections since Abraham Lincoln, Salem voted as the country did 23 times. 20% of its people are poor, 15% make over 10,000 a year. The national income figures are precisely the same. The only important area where it is not average is in its racial balance. It is 29% Negro, which is not average, but not unusual. It is an old town dating from the 17th century. Descendants of the early settlers now sell shoes, automobiles, fill teeth, and join the J.C.s. In its good qualities and bad, Salem is every American small town you ever saw. Its folk hero is Robert Johnson. In 1820, it is said, he stood on the courthouse steps and ate a tomato to prove it was not poisonous. Well, the result now is a ketchup factory, and the result of that is a glass factory making ketchup bottles. Farmers nearby raise tomatoes, a factory buys them for ketchup, and another one makes the bottles, an arrangement that could hardly be neater. When Johnson ate the tomato, people waited for him to drop dead. Historians since have called it a publicity stunt. If it was, it worked. The town has lived on it ever since. The mayor is Norris Williams, an automobile dealer here seen at work, offering a customer a sweet deal with a top dollar trade-in. He is Republican. Most of the town council is Democratic. The town government occupies what used to be a bank. One recent municipal problem was this. The chief of police wanted a flashing red light on top of his patrol car. The mayor refused to let him have it. So they had a feud for five years until they got a new mayor and the chief got his light. Faces carved on the building cornice are officers of the old bank. That was the cashier, Benjamin Acton. The only political club in town is Republican, but it's not very political and not very elegant. It's the Garfield Club, upstairs over a shoe store, three flights of wooden steps that squeak. But once up there, we find a lovely scene. The members playing rummy and pinochle, a roll-top desk, a phone with a sign on it saying, incoming calls only, dues of about 20 cents a week, a hand-colored portrait of President James A. Garfield, and a club dinner once a month, usually of muskrat, and what must be the best pool players in town. Trace, I'm playing that nine ball back here in the corner pocket. There are two weekly newspapers, one Republican and one Democratic. 
The Democratic paper has what must be the most engaging name of any paper anywhere. It is called the Salem Sunbeam. One man, Tom Bowen, owns and writes the editorials for both of them. He is Democratic on Mondays and Republican on Wednesdays, but then any man of genuine intellectual skill can take either side of any argument. And Tom Bowen is a civilized man who would be a credit to any town. Well, as usual, today's discount dropped a double truck in our laps at the last minute. We're up to 2,900 now, and the back shop seems pretty clear. Before Bowen owned it, the Sunbeam attacked a local political candidate for selling cider on Sundays. But under his editorship, it has never been that extremist. Now, like everybody else in town, it is arguing about building a new courthouse, and if so, where? The old one was declared inadequate in 1885. The argument started then and has never stopped. In the meantime, they've made do with the old one. The clerk is Tommy Greaves, perhaps the best-liked man in town, who tells us a little about his court and why he would live nowhere but Salem. Most of the cases that we handle in this court are of a civil nature. We have a few criminal cases once in a while, very good murder once in a while, as we might term it. I remember back in the 30s, we had a very sensational murder trial here. It was so sensational, we had a lot of the press from the eastern seaboard down here. Dorothy Kilgallen was down, and this was her first assignment. This courtroom was filled to capacity. I think at that time, uh, even the farmers didn't do too much work. A man was murdered, and it was a, caused by a love affair between his wife and a neighbor. Needless to say, it did cause quite a sensation around here because everyone knew all the principals around here. And uh, in fact, Salem as a whole very rarely has anything of that nature. Speaking of Salem, I think this is about the nicest place in the world. In large cities, I think you lose out on the personal touch. Uh, in Salem, we know about, we have a speaking acquaintance with about 85% of the people. You, like when I go to the bank, which is only about 200 feet from my office, it usually takes me 35 to 40 minutes to go there. You stop and speak to people on the street. After you get in the bank, you talk with the tellers, also the executives of the bank. And on your return trip, you usually run into two or three people, and you talk very intimately because you know a lot of the intimate facts of the, the families. And uh, by being in a small city like this, you do that. In large cities, I've visited relatives in New York and Pennsylvania, or New York and Philadelphia, rather, and uh, they don't even know who lives next door to them. It's little things like this that make Salem the good town that it is, and that's one reason why I don't care to go on vacations. I'm satisfied with living and staying in Salem. Like most towns small enough for their architectural anatomy to be visible, Salem's oldest and handsomest houses are in the very center where the town started. 18th century, Georgian, available now for 15 or $20,000, though if moved to New York's east side or Washington's Georgetown, they'd bring 100000 Moving outward, you find a ring of 19th century Victorian, many of them boarding houses, then a ring of bungalows from the 1920s, and farthest out, the post-war suburbs. Salem's newest suburbs are average, and the average is ugly. But ugliest of all are the slums, mainly Negro. They have the usual, the average look of neglected and unkempt decay. Salem has four slum landlords, about average for an average town, and the story is the average story. High rents from miserable housing where the tenants don't keep it clean and the landlords don't care. There's an urban renewal plan in the works and has been for 10 years, but not much has happened. Slums are profitable, more so than decent real estate, mainly because of federal and local tax law. So the slum landlords are not anxious for urban renewal. It would cost them money, and that too is average. Underneath this oak tree, John Fenwick made peace with the Lenni Lenape Indians that inhabited this region. At that time, 
He named the area Salem, which means peace. It has been said that of all the colonies along the eastern seaboard, this was the most peaceful, for never was a white man killed by an Indian, nor an Indian killed by a white man. The town is ashamed of its slums and objected to our photographing them, but it's intensely proud of its 18th century houses that have been kept up. And here is the County Historical Society engrossed in a slide lecture put on by Mrs. Stephen Joseph, telling facts and legends about Salem's past. This house was built in 1788, and it is believed that this was where Zadok Street was living when he and his family left Four Points West. About the turn of the 19th century, Zadok Street gathered all his worldly possessions and his family, and with a wagon train, set out from Salem to join the great migration westward. His first stop was in Ohio, where he founded a town and again named it Salem. As the frontier was pushed ever backward, so went the street family. And we have today Salem in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and as far west as Oregon, all named by Zadak Street or his descendants. And now we are back under the old oak where we left a short while ago. We hope you have enjoyed the trip. The proudest local monument is the Salem Oak, a splendid 500-year-old tree standing in the middle of a Quaker graveyard. It appears on the town seal and letterhead, a street name, hundreds of Sunday painters' canvases, a high school newspaper, the Rotary Club newsletter, plus bottles, glasses, cream pitchers, china plates, postcards, and the Salem Oak Diner. To find out what is on people's minds in Average Town in this election year, NBC News commissioned a Gallup survey. Hundreds of interviews asking the same questions all over town. People were asked what they were worried about, what they thought the political issues were this year, what they did for recreation, and others, as we'll hear. All the interviews were first conducted privately in Gallup's normal way. Then the representative sample were repeated with the cameras there. Some of the answers were remarkably candid. In a fish market near the waterfront, a Gallup interviewer questioned James Mahone, who does odd jobs around town. Day in and day out, what do you yourself worry about most? The only thing that I worry about at all is my kids. Now, uh... I raised nine kids, and they all done all right. I never had no problem with them. Only one of them, she married a louse. Of course, now he's a good louse. He's dead, so <laughs> that's it. Now we got a good louse in the family. We buried him. Do you find it hard to live on your family income without going into debt or not? Well, no. I don't. For the simple reason, I don't have no big elaborate household. I also don't have no fancy automobile, no fancy clothes. I don't drink. I don't run around to nightclubs and beer joints. And I don't run around with no fast women or don't play slow horses. And therefore, what little I make, I can live on it. Bread, meat, and potatoes, that's me. What do you yourself think is the most important issue that should be discussed by the candidates in the forthcoming election campaign? Well, personally, I think the most important, as far as the public, general public concern, is this foreign giveaway. It's called, called foreign aid. Why do you think that? We're spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need to please somebody we don't like, and they don't like us. Do you think the Democratic administration is pushing racial integration too fast? Too fast oh. and too hard. How would you feel about a law which would get all persons, Negroes as well as whites, the right to be served in public places, such as hotels, restaurants, theaters, and similar establishments? Uh, in this respect, I would say that would be all right. But at all times, regards to race, creed, or color, they must be ladies and gentlemen. When they cease to be that, 
they are undesirable citizens, and they should be thrown out, period. Do you think such a law should or should not apply to small businesses like beauty parlors, barber shops? No, I don't houses? think it should. Why don't you? Uh, all right. You want it, for instance? I'll give it to you. Now, of course, right now I need a haircut, and I'll get my haircut. But you think I'm going to go to a barber shop where he's cut some burrhead's hair and got that goo grease all over it? Got more grease than you get on a bear. You think I want that on mine? No. Would you be willing for the United States to engage in an all-out atomic war to stop the communists? Or yeah, not? sure. 100%. So everything you got, when you got it. Under what conditions, if any, would you be willing to see the United States reduce its armaments and armed forces? None whatsoever. Do you think the United States should do more or should do less to strengthen the United Nations? I think it should drop it. There's been a lot of talk about the United States losing the Cold War to the communists. How do you feel about this? As far as this Cold War is concerned, we've lost that critter. On the other side of town, in the high rent district, an interview with Elmer McCormick, news editor of a local paper, a collector of clocks, hi-fi, Lincoln prints, and police calls. Day in and day out, what do you yourself worry about the most? Well, Mrs. Stone, I try not to uh, worry at all. Uh, every morning before I go to work, I take some uh, apple juice and vinegar, a small teaspoonful of vinegar, and then I repeat that in the evening before dinner, and sometimes in the middle of the day. I think it has the um, effect of acting as a tranquilizer or something of that sort. Who would you like to see nominated as the Republican candidate for 1964? Nixon. Do you think the Democratic administration is pushing racial integration too fast or not fast enough? I would like to see it move, uh, move forward uh, much more rapidly and have the uh, issue settled once for all. Do you think that the amount of public welfare we have now tends to weaken a person's incentive to look for a job? Very much so, yes. There has been a lot of talk about the United States losing the Cold War to the Communists. How do you feel about this? Well, I don't know whether we're uh, actually losing it or not. I hate to see our soldiers scattered around in some of the places they are. And why do you feel this way? Well, in Vietnam, we had a, we had a sailor boy who was killed there, which uh, made some of us realize, uh, perhaps a whole lot more, the situation which the United States was, uh, I'm sorry that we ever got into, a, into the fighting there. I wish we hadn't. The soldier he refers to was Claude McBride. His mother is Mrs. Grace McBride, and she is angry. All these boys are getting killed for nothing. And they are. Nothing is coming out of it. To me, it's murder. If it's not war, it's murder. And that's exactly what's happening to them, boys. They're getting killed over there for nothing. What are they getting for? It? Nothing. Uh, they, well, they're just getting nothing. <clears throat> but that is my opinion. Now, his opinion was if, if, we let this go. This is a little place. Then they'll get a little bigger place, and a little bigger place, and a little bigger place. So, Mom, I'm doing this for you and the ones that are home. And this is what he was fighting for. This is what he gave his life for. Well, would you favor an all-out nuclear atomic war if necessary to stop? Definitely. And get it over with. Blow him off the map. Blow him right off the map. What do you think is the biggest and most important issue? Foreign affairs. 
foreign affairs. Definitely. Definitely foreign affairs. Foreign affairs. This civil rights business, that can take care of itself. But foreign affairs. Because foreign affairs are getting people killed. Our boys killed every day. Civil rights is the most important issue that they should discuss in the next forthcoming campaign. I'm interested in knowing why you feel... Dr. John T. Dooley, a physician, a member of the NAACP. The civil rights issue is something that affects our image abroad. They see churches being bombed. Little girls have been killed. They see police attacking people with fire hoses, police dogs, all because of their race, all because these people are just want a place to eat or to vote in some communities, a basic rights which to which every American is guaranteed by the Constitution. Would you be willing for the United States to engage in an all-out atomic war to stop the communists? The very thought of such a thing happening, you know, such an all-out nuclear war, would keeps me from sleeping at night. Answering questions while she does the ironing, Mrs. Russell Spina, a young housewife. Her husband is a farmer. They have one daughter. Which one of the um, candidates for the Republican on the Republicans' ticket would you like to see nominated for president this year? I imagine I'd like to see Lodge, but I wouldn't vote for him. I, uh, I'd vote for President Johnson. If he runs. <laughs> Why? I think he's had as much or more experience. How do you feel about Rockefeller? If Rockefeller can't win in his own territory, he, he certainly can't win around the country. What about Goldwater? Goldwater reminds me of a beatnik. He has some kooky ideas. What about Nixon? Uh, he's a three-time loser. I don't think he's going to win. Uh, he's lost too many times. Uh, nobody puts all their money on a loser. Taking everything into consideration, do you think we're getting our money's worth out of foreign aid? I definitely don't think we're getting our money's worth out of foreign aid. Let's keep some of the money here right in the United States. For instance, you can go on some of the back streets right around the corner from me, a half a block, and see houses that just aren't fit to live in. Any, anyone could just can't, oh, you just can't imagine the sickness and the uh, poverty. Right here in Salem, uh, the people that uh, don't have shoes and, and clothes and, well, for instance, every morning, Two or three trash pickers go by my door. By trash pickers, they go to the city dump, and they gather up cardboard, and they bring it here to the dump yard and sell it for 20 or 30 cents, and that's what they live on. That's their support. That's all they have. And it's really a shame. I think some of the foreign aid money should just stay right here. Let's call it Salem aid or United States aid. An interview with Mrs. Margie Jackson, who works in the glass factory where she inspects for flaws in bottles on the assembly line. Well, I myself worry about financial problems and make it ends meet because I'm alone, I have a child. Do you find it hard to live on your family income without getting into debt? Well, my income, if I make $140, that's every two weeks. Time I pay out, $25 for him to be taken care of. Time I pay my rent, my electric, and then try to buy food, and then try to make my installment. I don't have it. What do you do personally for amusement and recreation? I like to go to bars, clubs, entertainment, travel, and the greatest hobby I have, I love to flirt with the men. Who would you like to see as the presidential candidate for the Republican Party in the forthcoming election? Well, I don't know whether he is a Republican or Democrat, but I think President Johnson will work out pretty good because the foundation has already been laid. Uh, President Kennedy, he has laid the foundation. All he has to do now is put the bricks that he has picked out in the right places. What do you yourself think is the most important issue that should be discussed by the candidates in the forthcoming election campaign? 
I think the most important thing is to get the civil rights over with. Do you think it's too easy or too difficult for people to get public welfare payments? Well, from what I can see, I think it's too easy. Because those that don't need it seem to be the easiest one to get it. Now, for instance, there's a girl here now. She has children, which the state has taken one. She still has the others here. She gets her check a month. She visits the bar just as regular as I do. And she has a little young jitterbug, a young fellow from about 17 to 20. He doesn't work. And a jitterbug isn't her, isn't her son, it's her boyfriend. Now, if she could afford to buy her little jitterbug two cars, she could afford to go to work and take care of her own family. But as long as life is that easy, well, I don't blame her for not going to work. Even though it burns me up, though, to see him walk around and ride, and I have to walk and drink as much beer as I want to drink. I mean, I can't see it. Day in and day out, what do you yourself worry about most? Well, I work in a glass factory, Anchor Hawkins. It's number six plant. You work on a leer. A leer is a long conveyor. And on that conveyor, there is probably on some leers, there is 30 bottles cut a minute. Some of them 52 bottles a minute. Some of them 80 bottles a minute. When they pick, when they come down to you, you pick them up and you present them for all kind of defects. Well, you constantly stand and look at those bottles come down for eight hours, and every minute on the minute there's a bottle, and that one comes down full. It is annoying. When more than 600 interviews in this one small town were finished and tabulated, it was found the country's foremost problem, in Salem's opinion, was race friction and segregation. Dr. Gallup told us this was the first year any domestic issue had been mentioned more than foreign affairs. More people in average towns said they were worried about race than said they were worried about war and peace. It may be unsettling, but it is a fact. Actually, two surveys were made, one in February and another in late May, to detect any changes. Between surveys, there was the threatened stall-in at the World's Fair, several well-publicized demonstrations, riots, and violence, some stabbings and murders, and in the second survey, race friction was mentioned even more. So that was first, by far. International problems were second. Then unemployment, high taxes, delinquent juveniles, and on down the familiar list. The first choice for president, overwhelmingly, was Johnson. The first choice of the Republicans for their own party nominee was Lodge. Then Nixon, then Rockefeller, Goldwater was a weak fourth. Lodge was first with 38% of the Republicans. Goldwater was fourth with 7%. Gallup interviewers also asked people what they personally worried about. The first answer was money, and the second was children. The high school is good, but once the town educates the youngsters, it loses them. Of the class of 1954, 80% moved away to where the chances were greater, the lights brighter, and the pay higher. The school cafeteria is too small, so at noon they ramble down to a restaurant offering bad food garnished with pinball machines, or to the pool room. They used to go to McCoubrey's drugstore. But Mr. McCubrey, after the Surgeon General's report, wouldn't let them smoke, so they took their trade elsewhere. <laughs> Parents worry about their morality, since an agony of parenthood is to discover children are as bad as their parents were. It may be, though hard to prove, that they're a little worse. 
It seems that most of them behave pretty well, but their commonest complaint is that in Salem there is nothing to do. There is a good deal of drinking, often of a cheap, supercharged wine called Tiger Rose. Perhaps as a result, illegitimacy is shockingly high. At Salem Hospital, it is more than 20%. <laughs> Judy Ayers, a local girl who is Miss New Jersey, had these insights on Salem's juveniles. Judy, day in and day out, what do you worry about most? Well, boring. <laughs> That's my problem. And um, what do you money. Mean? <laughs> uh, what do you mean you worry about boys? Oh, <laughs> well, the boy, there aren't that many nice boys around. and. I just have my problems. I don't think I'd better go into it. It's a long story. From what you observe, what do you think is the biggest problem that Salem, the community, has? Um, well, for me right now, I think the biggest problem is the, the activities for the teenagers. Anything that is in Salem for a teenager to do is to ride up and down the streets of Salem, back and forth from Boscos to the, to the food fair, to Boscos. <laughs> And slow horns at each other. <laughs> What's, what do you do at Bosco? What do they do at Bosco? It's like a, this teenage hangout. Because, you know, you go in there and it's just, it looks like a man, it looks like the, paper, the place is really packed. And you go inside and there isn't anybody in there. <laughs> They're all out in the parking lot. <laughs> I think that some of the moral breakdown is, uh, where there are a lot of pregnancies and illegitimate children. Uh, we're having quite a few here. Uh, you're having a lot of them in all the other places, I think. And some comments from a civic leader, a member of one of the town's oldest families, Mrs. Mildred Plyler Dorothy Tiffany Acton. We don't have as many abortions around here that we know about as I have in other places that I've lived in. I'm not saying they aren't going on. I know that there have been arrests made in South Jersey, but not particularly in this town. And that is the one thing that I do like about it, that where we've run into these problems and where I've been called in on them, the mothers and fathers have stood with these children. And it makes it much easier for you to work with them. And the children have gone and told their parents on their problems, which again, I think is good. I, and where they have gone and told the ministers their problems, again, that stand, that's an outstanding uh, uh, attribute to the community. Mrs. Acton, do you know of any way Salem might reduce this teenage problem? Yes, I do. I think that uh, dancing is a very healthy, wholesome... Uh, um there is a teenage dance on Friday nights at the American Legion Hall, sponsored by the Young Republicans. Now, they tried integrating this, but it led to fights and rumbles. The dances are called the mashed potato, the monkey, the continental. The twist has been old hat for three years. It's over at 11, is heavily guarded by four deputies who don't allow any pastimes but dancing or watching. a fair test of the degree of snobbery in average town would be who gets into the country club. On that score, Salem gets an A. No Negro has ever applied, but otherwise it seems anybody gets in if he can pay the dues and behave himself. A Gallup interviewer got some interesting comments on that from Mrs. Linwood Thomas, a local Democratic committee woman and a newspaper social columnist. What do you do personally for amusement, recreation, and cultural activities? We uh, belong to the country club, and we enjoy a dinner dance once a month. We uh, uh, have a variety of friends down there. People assume when you say country club that right away you mean high class. But we have found that people are people no matter where you go, and we have as much fun 
with the people down there as we do anywhere. I have been in a bar and met some uh, nice people, and I think you meet them anywhere. Of course, you also run up against some that aren't quite as nice, even though they have a little bit of money. As a matter of fact, I can remember dancing once at the country club with an elderly man that run his tongue around my ear, which I didn't enjoy at all, but he said he thought that BNP was drunk and I was drunk, it didn't make any difference. I called him a leecherous old goat and told him it made a big difference to me whether I was drunk or not. But Average Town's basic social mechanism is the churches. Newcomers wanting friends and acceptance are always advised to join one, anyone. There are 23, one for every 391 people, and a choice of 15 different faiths and denominations. Mr. Dixon, day in and day out, what do you worry about most? Religion. Uh, I know the second coming of Christ is very near. Well, a lot of people aren't ready. The second, coming, the second coming of Christ is just about upon us. In the Presbyterian Church, a young man named James Galbraith described his own religious experience. About five years ago, a wonderful Christian couple moved to the city of Salem. The profound influence that they gave to this community is still growing. Through their Christian efforts, they started these women prayer groups. The first group, I believe, had about nine women in it, and since then they have grown to about 12 groups of nine. They have men's prayer groups, they have couples prayer groups, and they're going like every day in the week. The influence that this has had on our lives in Salem has been something wonderful. I would like to relate to you some of the things that have happened to me as a result of my association with these wonderful prayer groups. About three years ago, I was selling automobiles in the community. My marriage was a mess. My social life was a mess. I didn't know where I was going. My life was empty. And then I came under the influence of these radiant Christians, these people that had peace and joy and hope and a purpose in their life, that knew where they were going, and I wanted it. And I started to search. And finally, one day, I came to know Christ in a personal way. I turned my life over to him. And I said, Lord, I have messed up my life for 35 years. I give it to you. Take it. Use me as you would. And he did. He did a wonderful job, too. Within a matter of three months, I was in New York City making TV commercials, doing modeling, fashion work. Within less than a year, I was one of the top men in the agency. This year, in fact, they had an article in there about me that I was one of the three top men in my field. Now, I can stand here and brag about this because this is something that I didn't do on my own. Jesus Christ did it for me. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm getting ready for the day. The churches range from the oldest and most traditional to non-denominational institutions like the Calvary Temple, where the Reverend Harry Call leads a gospel rally. In the Civil War, Salem was a terminal on the Underground Railroad, the stream of slaves escaping from the South. So many of its Negroes have been here long enough to develop a middle-class society, as seen here. A group called the Willing Workers from the Baptist Church, having a hat show. And it is for a Sunday or any day that you have to go out. This is Miss Shirley Johnson wearing a white straw. 
But wherever you turn in average town, sooner or later, somebody brings up the race problem. Gallup's figures again showed it to be the first concern. 48% of the whites said there was too much welfare money. 41% of the Negroes said there was not enough. Established middle-class Negroes like these tend to blame the newcomers for the illegitimacy, slums, welfare lines, and crime, and tend to keep their distance, saying it is not their problem. A comment on that from one of the town's most respected citizens who lives in a house deeded to her family by William Penn in 1737, Mrs. Mary Meekham. We've had uh, some very fine colored citizens in Salem who have kept their people in line and they have earned the respect of the white people. They've been good businessmen and uh, people have trusted them and uh, there's never been, been any difficulty in that way. And that's one thing that's been one of the beauties of Salem. We've always had a very good class of reliable colored people in Salem that have uh, earned their rights to respect and citizenship that belong to them. And I think if every town had them as well regulated as we do, there wouldn't be that problem. Another view from the NAACP's Dr. John Dewey. The major problem facing Salem today is the integration problem. And the reason it is a problem is because no one knows it is a problem. And there's a lack of communication between the races on this issue. This town is older than Philadelphia. But until this past December, it was the first time that any Negroes at all had been hired to work in any of the stores on a local main street. The five and dime stores, one hired willingly, the other one unwillingly. Another citizen who works for DuPont lives in the oldest house in town, built in 1687, Adrian Toms. Uh, some months ago, there was some effort made to be sure that uh, the local establishments employed colored people, but Lord, we've been doing it for years, so there's nothing new in this. The town is widely integrated, but they don't always really mean it. Claude Inge, who works at the glass factory. I lived in Salem around 24 years, and which the race of the problem have eased up some since I have been, since I've come here within the 24 years, but some still exist. The restaurants is different now what they used to be, which you can go in them and you can get served. But still you will be shown before you leave there, you'll be shown that you're not wanted there. And like some beer gardens, they, after you drink your beer, they'll take the glass and break it and all that kind of stuff right in front of your face. Another contribution to Salem's favorite subject from William Bartleson, Jr., also of the glass factory. If a man, a man don't feel that he wants to serve somebody, I don't think that they have the right to tell him he has to. Charles, uh, that's not my way of reading the Constitution. It makes you feel awful bad to even know of, of uh, such thing as discrimination in places you can't go and you can't do this and you can't... Which it makes you feel bad and you, you think of it. It makes you feel less than a citizen of the United States. And how can a person go ahead and do his best at anything when he feels less than a citizen? We, as a community, sort of ignored this problem, and most of the people sort of would, might say, stick their head in the sand like an ostrich. And if it, if it's not here, to, if it, maybe it'll go away after a while, but it's not going to go away. It's going to get more and more. And as time goes on, I expect we will begin to experience situations such as have in other places, but we don't have to. It I don't think it should be pushed any faster. I think that uh, if they just take it easy and each state work it out as they see best in their own locality, it'll work out better. Then we'd be spared some of these disgraceful riots and going on the past.
I don't believe that uh, they are uh, approaching this thing, possibly in the best manner, by forcing the issue with the sit-downs and the street brawling and so forth. Maybe that's not the way, but uh, as a minority race, were we in the minority, we might do the same thing. What would do more good around here? I say if it is at least 15 colored people, would catch white people at the right place and talk to them. I believe that would do more good than demonstrating. I believe that would do more good. Let, get an understanding. That's what's the matter with the world today. The world just don't have an understanding with each other. I talked with some white, and they would, the uh, first thing would come up, what do the colored man want? Well, he's going to school with us. What else do he want? He want the whole world? I said, no, I don't think so. All the colored man want is what is promised to him. And the Constitution is promised equal rights. and figures. On summer afternoons, the winds off the factory carry over town the fragrance of ketchup. In April, the shad come up the river and everybody eats them. In a town that small, everybody knows what everybody else is worth. In summer, all but the bankers, lawyers, and some of the doctors come to work in sports shirts. The firemen are all volunteers and crowd, and once there was talk of paying them, they were so furious they threatened to quit. There were two town drunks, both of them died, 
There was a little gambling once upstairs over a restaurant, but they closed it down. The police records show about as many cases of husband beating as of wife beating. The only bookstore in town is a rack of paperbacks at the drugstore. Well, Average Town became what it is as part of a national society, and it has nothing good or bad that can't be matched elsewhere. It's 9,000 people go to church, love their neighbors only if they are white, worry about money, debt, children, plan to vote for Johnson, have no interest in the radical right or the radical left, but a great interest in making money, making ketchup, and the bottles to put it in. That is the society we have built, and like it or not, on the average, that's what it is.